Well, thank you, thank you, Dennis, and the other organisers of the conference for for this opportunity to share on the on this knowledge. So, my name is Jean Francois Sobietsky. I am an ethnobotanist and a natural medicine healer from Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm really happy to be here today to be able to share with you on the role of psychoactive plants in South African traditional medicine. Uh, um, I have my holistic healing practice in Joburg, so I integrate nutrition and herbal medicine and uh, transformation work for people who, to help heal people. So today I'm going to look spe uh, uh, specifically and particularly on psychoactive plant medicines as perturbatory learning tools in the initiation process of South African uh, and Amazonian traditional healers, <clears throat> and also giving an overview of psychoactive plant uh, research from South Africa. So, until relatively recently, the subject of psychoactive plant use um, in Southern Africa has been greatly overlooked. It's only in the last 20 years have some researchers showed uh, renewed interest in this, in, this, in this subject. Some of the, 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 the reasons put forward why this is, this paucity of research in Southern Africa, has been, um, some people have put forward that it's a researcher bias against substance use. But what's also interesting, in, what, what I've kind of seen is that in Southern Africa, in South Africa especially, there was a cultural split in the research on, the, on, the, on traditional medicine because of the apartheid um, uh, era. Um, and this is indicated by the fact that um, only 7% of studies were dedicated to magical and traditional medicine plants around like magic, for example. Most of the studies focused on, plant, on food plants. So, there was a kind of a skewed research focus, um, which was a bit of a prejudice against traditional medicine in South Africa. And um, other reasons could be also the overlooking of sub subtle acting psychoactive effects. So this whole focus on visionary plant use, um, often people might have missed the more subtle acting plants, and I'm gonna be going through with the, uh, those plants with you today. So, in, around, in, 1990, in 1998, after having studied and experimented with, with San Pedro and Ayahuasca, I, I didn't understand this, you know, like this, this kind of Africa is considered to be poor in psychoactive plants because we have a very rich traditions of healing, healing traditions in Southern Africa, and we have a very rich flora. So I was, it just didn't um, compute for me. So I set off to answer this question, are the Izangoma, which are the diviners, those are the, the spiritual people, the healers with the second sight, are they using visionary plants to aid their spiritual healing practices like around the rest of the world? And that um, took me on a journey, a very interesting journey that lasted from 1998. This is a, um, <coughs> the Muti market in Johannesburg, and Muti is the collective African term for plant medicines. But it also includes, um, it's any traditional medicine, so even animal, so you find lots of animal parts there. Um, and it's like a pharmacy, like any, any medicinal market around the world. You just have to know what you're looking for, and there's, it's really interesting because there's um, plants from, a lot of plants from India that are used in Ayurveda that you'll find there too, like Rubia cordifolia, for example, but they just have different names, but the same uses. So this was really fascinating because I could start seeing cross-cultural patterns of plant use. What I did was I actually found the traditional healers through word of mouth, and then I just went on my own accord, and I was just driven by a passion and a curiosity to know this question. So I just went and I started asking healers, are you using you know, plants for visionary purposes? And a lot of healers were very resistant. Most of them were actually very resistant, but some healers, like I'll show you later, my, my teacher was very open and she helped. She, um, she was very open from the first start. So around this time also in 2000, I met Professor ben Eric van Weyck from the University of Johannesburg, who was, um, who was writing a book with a chapter on mind and mood plants. And this was very rare at that time because there wasn't much research focus at that time. And, and together with Nigel Herica, who's, who's here. And, um, and we actually only just met now, even though we've known, each other for such, known of each other for such a long time. This led me to do actually an inventory. I undertook this mammoth task of combing the ethnographic literature and ethnobotanical literature for all, all the instances of psychoactive plant use mentions. And that was truly an exciting journey. Um, I was in the William Cullen basement libraries, like sifting through these old ethnographies from priests like Father Ladyvant. 
he was actually one priest that actually wrote the first paper that really like wowed me because he actually the paper was called um, the religious use of plants by the that particular group I think it was I forget the exact uh, group but then he actually said um, all these plants in divination and these plants being used in the initiation they probably do have psychoactive purposes uh, psychoactive properties and I was like wow this this guy is is, is um, you know, I really uh, he inspired me a lot so um, so that set me off on this journey where I found mentions of very interesting plant use. For example, um, everything from the Tsonga Gobo ritual, it's called the Gobo ritual, where the initiate would put their face in a calabash of water mixed with medicines, and they would open their eyes, and they would cross the ocean. So the, the description was crossing the ocean, and this was in an, um, in an anthropologist's work called Junod. And he also mentioned that black and red dots, and this I recognized from Heinrich Kluver's work, which I also was my favorite book in University of Mescal and the Mechanisms of Hallucination. And so then I recognized this and I thought, well, this is definitely visionary. And so everything from that to ant's nest being smoked near Lake Sabaya on the East Coast. And then I saw another, I saw cross-cultural patterns. In Mexico, they also smoke ant's nests for visionary purposes. From, from that to white seaweed, which is made into an ubulao, which is, I'll explain, it's a vomiting medicine. Um, to also the use of, by the sand bushmen of a diamphida, diamphidia lava, which they would smoke with tobacco to have, to have visions. And that uh, ca um, caterpillar eats the, the Comifora africana tree. So it's being, whatever is in the Comifora is being sequestered, of course. And that could be, well, um, that would be a very interesting thing to investigate. What is, what is that? Is it a peptide or what is it in that lava? And that's, um, so these little gems popped up, you know, like all along the way, which made it really um, interesting. And what I also noticed is in one paper on the initiation plant use by Juruguay et al., um, where, they, where they actually, we'll look at it a bit later, um, where he, he looks at the initiation plant use by the curanderos in, the, in central eastern Peru. There was quite, the, in that one paper, there was about eight to ten, about eight or so, plants, um, species that were exactly, is also used in Southern African traditional um, initiation. So um, some of them is like the cypress. Others would be um, Tabo Montana species, which are definitely, have got an interesting visionary psychoactive um, use. Um, Chenopodium ambrosoides, for example, etc. So there was these overlaps in, in, the, in the plant use, which is also interesting. What I also looked at, um, knowing that around the world, in like the Delphic Oracle and many divination systems, psychoactive plants are used to facilitate divination, I did a review of that. And what I found was that 45% of the plants reported for uses in divination in Southern Africa also have other um, straightforward psychoactive uses from the inventory. So that's, that's quite significant. So 45%. There was, uh, there's obviously a relationship there between plants used for divination and then having psychoactive properties. One very interesting plant I came across is Synaptolepis kirki. So <clears throat> this is a rhizome of, of this um, medium-sized tree shrub. And what they do, the, the Sangormas, what they do is they take one tablespoon of the powder and they add it to five to 10 liters of water and then they vomit with it. And I'll explain why vomiting medicine is so important in, in their traditions, why they consider it important. But what it does, it actually has a very interesting effect on the sleep cycles and dream cycles. So a lot of psychonauts today are actually using concentrated amount, like 600 milligrams, I think it is. And what's, in, what's interesting to note is that traditionally, when you would vomit with five to 10 liters with two tablespoons, the amount after vomiting is very, very small amount and it remains in the system. So I think people might be overdosing psychonauts, you know, taking straight 600 milligrams. But what's really also interesting is that two uh, psychonauts reported that it seems to create a fluidity, or co um, a connection with the dream state even years later after using it once or twice. So there is, there is an interesting, that's an interesting phenomenon that I'd love to understand, like how this, um, this person, for example, in America who took it, they actually had the same type of dreamscape 
like periodically over till now, like every six, seven months, they would have this kind of Uvuma would visit them in the dreamscape. So what's happening there, I'm not sure if it's an associative thing, but it's uh, two psychonauts and one, uh, well, one researcher and also mentioned silene species having this fluidity of connection, dream connection, which is fascinating. So much more field workers um, needed to investigate these things, these plants. And so before we go on, I just wanted to introduce to you a general um, overview of the worldview of the South African traditional healing. So the traditional healers, this, they are collectively the Southern Bantu speaking people. And what's interesting is that they have the same similar uh, worldview to the Amazonian cosmovision of the, you know, the integrated aspect of the physical, spiritual nature and existence. It's, it's, they don't really dichotomize between, between those, those, those um, distinctions. But there's a very, very heavy reliance and belief in the ancestral spirits, so they, you, they're deceased ancestors. And a lot of these psychoactive plants, like the ubulao, you would, they, would, they would use it to have a dream connection to their ancestors. So often the traditional uh, healers would speak of their ancestors communicating in their dreams to actually even tell them which plants to use in ubulao mixtures. So I'm not sure how that compares in South America with, um, with the shamans there. If they, uh, I think on the An in the Andean context, there is a lot of, um, um, what's a Bonnie, um, uh, what's her name? The one researcher, Glasscoffin, she mentioned that San Pedro has a very strong connection with ancestor worship in Peru and water bodies. <laughs> so there is a, it's interesting that there's that ancestor connection there too. But the, the Southern Bantu speaking people, they, so they believe in the ancestors, but they also have shamanic beliefs integrated because of their exchange, cultural exchange with the Bushmen, with the San Koi, Koi San Bushmen, who were classical um, shamans like in Eliadi, you know, like soul flight and that. And what's really interesting is one day my teacher, Mrs. Maponya, she actually just as a matter of, uh, you know, uh, anecdotally, just said that she visited her homestead the night before to see what was happening and she woke up really tired and I was like, wow. That in my mind was a classical soul flight, you know, um, remote viewing and checking out what's going on and then coming back. So they do have shamanic um, uh, attributes, even though they're pa pastoralists and, and um, cultivators. So they, they rely on cattle a lot, and cattle is very important, but there's this mixture of shamanic and um, cultivator um, kind of beliefs. So the category is in South Africa, you get your Sangomas, which are born with the gift, that's with second sight. So they're born with the, the gift of being a, um, a Sangoma, and they often can't, they need to take up that calling. If they don't, they get sick. So that's a typical uh, shamanic healing crisis. And then you get the doctors of the herbs, the herbalists. So the herbalists, they both go through similar initiations. That's, was, that's my teacher, Leti uh, Maponya, Maponya, Mrs. Maponya. I was really fortunate to meet her along the way. I met probably about 40, 50 traditional healers doing field work in Johannesburg. And she was an exemplary healer. She, was, she mastered herself. She was incredibly mindful. And she taught me, she, she exemplified a, a, a real healer who perfected the art. And um, she taught me the deeper dynamics of traditional medicine. So I, I met with her in 1999, and that continued a 14-year relationship on and off. Uh, we are developed first as an informant, but then as a, as a friend, and then as an apprentice-teacher kind of relationship. So that's me there, um, preparing some medicines for her, and there, there would be this um, continual learning process along the way. And sorry, to, um, Mrs. Maponya was Northern Sutu, uh, that was the tribe, and um, she was very, very knowledgeable about plant medicines and healing generally. I learned a lot from her. One thing that I learned along the way is that with her is that there's, there's you could consider that there's two major groupings of psychoactive plants in South Africa and Southern Africa. You get the strong acting visionary plants, like the ayahuascas, and then you get the more subtle acting, so that's the, the bulb of the bufane, and then you get the subtle acting plants, which are like, uh, called the ubulao. And 
Ubulao, by the way, means the spirit that controls one, which is really interesting. Um, I need to do much more fieldwork research to understand if it's the ancestor spirits that control one or the plant, the plant spirits. Because the, the, the healers that I've spoken to believe that there's both. There are plant spirits, but there's also your ancestor spirits. But it means the spirit that controls one. So this, this example of bufane, the stisha, is the sand poison bulb. So they used that bulb in hunting as an uh, arrow poison. But what they do also is they make a medicine of this where they boil the, 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 the bulb into a decoction and a small amount is used to uh, divine with. So they, you watch the television. So in fact, when I started my field work, the first report that I, when I got into that one location, so the, in South Africa, the locations where the African people live, they're still there, of course. They establish structures, um, even though it's very integrated now. Um, somebody just said, yes, they're using Norto. So it's called Norto. And, some, and this traditional healer next door is using it for a patient to see who stole her car. So you basically watch the television and then you see things. But the thing about this plant, it's very strong. It's a very strong plant spirit. Um, along the way, I started to have a relationship with the plant and it just, it has power. So, and it can kill you. So it's very, very small margin. The margin of toxicity is very small in terms of medicine and then lethal dose. So I wouldn't recommend, and there's also to, to just experiment, but there are uh, Sangomas who specialize in giving this medicine which is a very powerful ancestral medicine. The sand bushmen, they actually found scales of the bulb. So this plant is a, a fascinating plant. The, the bulb scales are actually like a natural plaster that they use in initiation when they circumcise boys. So you just put it on the wound and it seals and, and it's antibacterial. So this is a flagship plant for the, for the family, for the Amaryll Amaryllidaceae, and it's a powerhouse of chemical production. It's, there's lots of chemistry going on in there. So um, that's, that's the, the bufane. And they, yes, they found the scales of, those, of, of the bulb in the sand burial sites. So it, it indicates that there was a spiritual use by the sand, not just physical. So the, the ubulaos, one very popular species now is Silene undulata, the dream root. So a lot of psychonauts are using it to induce dreaming. Um, and there, but there are a couple of different species of silene, and they're all used for ubulao. So that's the, the, plant, uh, the flower. Um, let's see here. So yes, yeah, so what is the basis of ubulao? So it's a, ubulao is a vomiting medicine. What's really interesting is having done this myself and then going to India, I noticed that they also use vomiting medicines to uncloud the vision. So, I was really fortunate to, to make a connection there because my teacher one day mentioned if she doesn't palaza, so palaza is vomiting with the medicine, her vision becomes clouded. And I found the exact same um, description in, in an Ayurvedic book of vimana therapy, that's vomiting therapy, that also gets rid of mucus from the chest and from the stomach and then unclouds the vision. So there is a cross-cultural traditional therapy going on there that has a direct effect on opening the mind. So the, these are the Ubalao species. Um, okay. So a bit more about Ubalao. So Ubalao is basically most often the roots of particular, many, there's many different Ubalao species, but what they all share in common is opening the mind. I think Nigel was talking about skeletium opening the mind. That is the definition that, that I understood from traditional healers, healers is that they churn this mixture of the roots in water. You do not boil. The, these are white medicines. So the white medicines are the ancestral medicines. And, when you, and you, after you churn it, you basically eat the foam. So it produces foam, often, those species. And you eat the foam at nighttime. And then in the morning, you drink that infusion, and then you vomit with it. And what's interesting is some researchers have put forward, and I, I think it's, it needs a bit more research, but I think it's probably the case, that that foam is being produced by saponins. And I found a paper on polygala species, which produce those saponins, which actually have um, the uh, dopamine and serotonin, they're actually dip dopamine and serotonin agonist properties of those polygala saponins. So the saponins might be a whole area of psychoactivity, which we need to, to research. 
It's most definitely utilized by the tra uh, traditional African people. I don't think it's a coincidence that so many species produce the foam. The foam is definitely psychoactive, and traditional healers say, when you vomit with the medicine every day, so what you do is, first thing in the morning, you light your candle, you churn the medicine, you pray with the medicine, you pray to your ancestors, you clean yourself. And what's important in that tradition is that cleanliness is close to godliness, the, the one traditional healer said. So for them, they don't actually rely too much on the strong visionary plants, on the, the, on the, uh, you know, the strong visionary plants. For them, it's when you're clean, you have that, that connection with the ancestors. And so keeping clean is, is actually the most important thing to have that dream connection and a connection with your intuition and sensitivity. So that's a silene undulata roots, and that's what it looks like. So once you've done that, then you carry on the rest of your day. But what's interesting, when, when I initiated finally with the medicine initiation, and most people having given this particular ubalao, you, you don't have any effects for about a week. So the first seven, eight days, nothing. But then the heat starts getting turned up in terms of intuition and sensitivity. You start literally feeling more. And this is a really interesting thing because in my case, I started, the deepest questions about my life were being like, I was faced with them that I couldn't escape them. So at day 12, using a particular uh, ubalao that I'm still investigating, what I call the mirror ubalao, it, um, it made me face these deep questions to the, to the level of intensity that it was like ayahuasca. At 12 days, I wanted to run away from this place that I was renting. I just couldn't, it was like on me. So it was, it was such a powerful tool of self-inquiry, like a mirror. So it's, it's a fascinating thing that, that I experienced. And um, yeah, so, so it depends also on the species. So this, this species in particular, Mantenhurst describes its use as for three days, the, the Corsa initiates would drink copious amounts of this infusion and dance all day. And what would happen is they would even have the smell of the medicine, the musky smell of this particular silene undulata in, you know, you could smell it because it's just what, what they would be consuming and lots of dreaming. So the silene undulata seems to trigger dreaming in a big way, like more than other ubalaos even. Um, and the initiates use that to connect with, their, with the dreamscape with their ancestors. So traditionally, these medicines are called, collectively, the Obulao is called lucky medicines. And initially, you know, I just for many years, it was like lucky medicines, whatever, it's just, you know, it's a, just a magical term. But what I realized eventually is that they're called lucky medicines because of cleaning the body, having increased um, clearer thinking, um, better dreams, more energy, because often they give you more energy, i.e. it's lucky to have experienced all those things. So what I notice is that often the South African traditional terms for medicines, if you dig deeper into the story of the traditional medicine, you'll understand it's not just magical or, you know, some, uh, some uh, it's not just magical or superstitious, but it's actually uh, what I call a metaphorical indicator of physiological actions. So for example, they also use licorice as a tonic and they call it mlomom nandi, which means sweet mouth. When you just hear that, you think, ah, oh, whatever. But it's actually indicating the tonic effects of licorice. So you talk nicely, you relax, you know. So those, it's actually really interesting to, to see those metaphorical uh, indicators in, in action. But there is also a lot of cultural pre prejudice. I mean, it's so deeply ingrained that you see adverts you know, everything from Stan Bushman, it's a big joke about rugby and, you know, and don't take grandmother's traditional medicine, take, you know, the, the, the modern day product. So there's this prejudice against, against traditional medicine, which is uh, deeply in, ingrained. So I eventually underwent, after many years of, of uh, learning from, from Mrs. Maponya, she eventually, the right time and right energy was that she decided to to initiate me with the plant, the formal sequence of initiation medicines. And so that was in uh, 2012, and I moved to Jeppe's town, downtown Johannesburg, to, to be close to her for instruction, and that lasted three months, nearly three months. And that was a period of time of introspection, isolation, it was, it was pretty much an isolation kind of a process most of the time, and, um, and a time of focusing on the self-knowledge facilitated by this medicine. And I had really some interesting experiences from everything from tonic plants that really, like I woke up the one morning after this tonic uh, combination, um, 
that gave me, I felt so super, like completely like full power, amazing energy. So, and my teacher understood these things. This is the thing, it's not just a, um, you know, just take this plant, that plant. There's actually a sequence of plants being used. So that sequence, what I went through, was first cleansing medicines. So I got steaming medicines that I steamed with that kind of, the idea was to cleanse yourself from the past, to cut energetic cords from the past, and it was very clear from the beginning she said no sex. And what I understand, understood from that and, and learning from her is that when you sleep with someone you form an energetic connection. So if you're gonna familiarize yourself with new behavior, you don't want any disturbing influence, especially human interaction and such deep connection. So the cleansing medicines um, I used, one of them was called Nguavuma. It's a very powerful um, um, cleanser. So you, you vomit with it and you also steam with it. And this plant has lots of tannins and flavonoids and it actually is really gets what they call rid of, of pollution. So it's both physical and spiritual. So that's a red medicine. And then, so after basically using these medicines for about a week, and there's a couple of different cleansing medicines, you feel more prepared to open up. So it's like a preparation phase for opening up. And so then you take the ubalao, and the ubalao, it increases your intuition and sensitivity, basically. Um, but most importantly, it, 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 it gives you who you are. So she explained, whatever you need to know about yourself, the ubala will facilitate, it's like an internal, it's a mirror. So if you're a healer, you're going to, going to have all the phenomena of the awakening intuition and dream recall, but if you're not a healer, you'll also get whatever lesson that you need. So it gives you who you are. Um, so that's a very powerful medicine. Um, then, so this is, one species of the dianthus, the carnation family. It's always like called me in a way. Like it's a magical plant. I don't know, something about dianthus, the carnation family just seems magical. And they definitely, they rely on it and I'd be very interested to know what chemistry, this is actually moyensis, it's not, it's moy and then not the S and then, so the S shouldn't be there in the middle. It's called chani bezwe and they mix that with other white medicines for the twasas to, to initiate. So that's one example. What I've realized recently is that why these medicines are so, are so uh, valuable is that while emotions are targeted in our consumer culture around products, my observation as a healer is that many people don't know how to engage their own dif uh, difficult emotions. There is, it's actually not really, I, I would say it's not taught in our society. So these kind of plants, they can actually help you to engage the, you know, the more difficult, disturbing emotions that we, that we're afflicted by. So, and that seems to be an underdeveloped faculty. I would, I would put forward that from what I've um, know about how our culture, our consumer culture works. Um, so they really are working with emotion, even on a, the psychedelic level. The two main ways that I see is the visualization, creating new stories and breaking patterns, and then also the working with your emotions. So this, these plants, these white medicines, they facilitate working with deeper levels of emotion. What was really interesting is after doing this for two weeks, I was in a very intense state, and then my teacher gave me a mixture of, um, she gave me a red medicine mixture, a strengthening mixture, which was antihypertensive, and it grounded me. So it literally grounded that flight. And so, um, it helped me to anchor myself and I felt very relaxed. I even put on some, some fluid. So, and so one of uh, the plants is called um, Maitinus undata or Dabulavalo. And Dabulavalo actually connotes shock. It means shock. So it's actually used to, to relax you. So a lot of the words, that, a lot of the indigenous terms actually mean what the, the action of the medicine is. So that was a grounding medicine. So I did that for about a week and then I, came to even kill. And then the last category that, I, that was introduced to me is protection medis uh, medicines. And healers, especially, they, they need to maintain this, their boundaries, and it's something that, we, that healers often battle with. Um, and that reminds me of the work of the shaman, you know, navigating energy, <coughs> managing energy. So these protection med uh, medicines, yes, they protect you from sorcery and from other you know, influences, but it's mostly to to help you have a strong boundary. <clears throat> so
So this, um, what, is, what is interesting after my initiation is I read a paper by Jerigoy who described the same sequence of those categories. In, in fact, he actually outlined that they're called, um, the four categories are uh, opening, I mean cleansing, then um, opening, then strengthening, and then protection medicines. And when I asked my teachers, uh, my teacher and others in Goma, they said this, this, the way that you use the medicine is so that you know who you are. So that's the bottom line of, of the initiation. It's the whole process of knowing who you are and then working with that and, and becoming ma more masterful, hopefully, in dealing with energies as a healer, if you're a healer, but they're, they're tools of self-inquiry. And so those are the four categories. And what I've put, uh, the hypothesis I've made is that these initiation, this initiation medicine process is a pragmatic technology used to interrupt old patterns of behavior and familiarize the initiate with new, enhanced states of awareness, self-inquiry growth, and potential self-mastery. And I've seen a number of cases in the literature, I'm sorry about the picture overlapping, but um, where, this, where psychoactive plants, especially on the neuroscience levels, seem to be being used as perturbatory tools on the nervous, on the nervous system level. So Dr. Frusa, men, uh, Frusa mentions interruption mechanism and Carhart Harris and his team um, talk about the entropic brain model. And this made me, made me think of the connection between the destabilizing, what I'd call destabilizing opening medicines, the white ubulao, and then the stabilizing red medicines. So Dr. Frusa goes, he talks about, this is a really interesting thing, he talks about this model, this artificial model called the interruption mechanism as part of a self-optimizing spiking neural network model. And in this study they found if the model brain is subjected to occasional perturbations that profoundly alter its normal state of activity, synaptic plasticity spon spontaneously starts to reshape the net's, uh, network's connectivity in a way that enhances coordination. So per perturbation seems to be a good thing uh, if you use it constructively. And on the brain level, interrupting patterning and familiarization, we are creatures of habit. So breaking habit seems to be a really important thing in healing. So because of our habits, we just, you know, we, often they're negative habits. If we can break habits, that, that's a wonderful thing. So that's the, the way that psychedelics work. And I would say from my experience with initiation medicines, that's, it definitely was perturbatory. And that's Robin Carhart Harris's work, The Entropic Brain. And they, they talk about interruption of the default mode network, which is also perturbatory in nature. From observations, giving people, also patients, this ubulao, it takes the person to a threshold state, to a state of tension, where they grapple with the past and where they want to go into the future. And it's a difficult place to be, I can tell you. Um, but that's where also breakthroughs can be made. So you, you also need to accept the lesson that, or the insights that you get. And some people can push away even when they've shown the answer. <laughs> that's our human nature. Um, but they are perturbatory, um, they're perturbatory tools. So perturbation um, as a healing tool, it, in many contexts, offers the opportunity to change behavior. And, um, but for that perturbation to become an adaptation, it needs to be anchored. And for that, what's, what's really interesting is I've made the connection between the traditional uh, way people take the plants in isolation. So you need a safe contained space. If you're gonna open up and you're gonna anchor properly, you need a safe space to emerge. So you can call it a holding perturbatory, holding that perturbatory energy in a particular ritual space. And then you of course need enough time to familiarize yourself with the new, with, 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 uh, with the practices, the enhanced states of awareness and also uh, new behaviors. And uh, yeah, that's why usually uh, initiates would, uh, would, would uh, traditionally initiate for two, three months, sometimes a year. And like, you know, in the Amazon, two years, even three years, depending. But sometimes we don't have that uh, luxury in the modern society. Um, and new associations are very important. Um, you, going back to old environments, if you make these breakthroughs, like with anything, with ayahuasca or ubulao, you old patterns reemerge. They re get reanimated. So trying to have new associations, going into a new home or new social networks is a good idea. And then also balancing. You need to balance the effects of the medicine. 
Uh, my teacher once said, too much power for a twasser is not good. They must also relax. So she, the way she described a lot of the actions was very eloquent in the Northern Situ. They're very colorful. It's a colorful language and very, very eloquent. So with all these plant medicines that need to be researched, because we've hardly researched any of them, there's some that have been researched chemically, but most of those 300 species haven't even been looked at yet. Um, together with the rise of, the, of depression. So depression, the World Health Organization predicts <clears throat> depression will become the second leading cause of disease burden by 2020. So this is scary. It's, it tells us that we're not actually using our minds to deal with stress and anxiety. Even though we've got all the technology in the world, we're still really battling to, to, to deal with anxiety and stress and depression. So this led me to have the vision of creating the Kanisa Healing Garden, which the vision I have is to create an, uh, a healing garden that will integrate research, healing activities, and conservation in, in one space um, for the African medicinal and psychoactive plants. And yeah, we, um, the aims of the project is to establish the garden uh, of, of these plants used to treat nervous system disease and illness. Um, so as to document this knowledge and also to create viable income for local um, communities using ethnobotanical tourism. So that's not happening in South Africa at the moment and it's, there's a huge potential. Even with simple medicines like the steaming medicines, it doesn't have to be the visionary plants. We, you know, a lot of people will, will benefit from just that cleansing, strengthening and mild opening. So there's a huge uh, I think potential there. And um, and a further net, uh, idea is to create a network of these gardens between South America and South Africa so that there can be collaborative projects, research sharing, um, and conservation. Because these plants, like for, for example, Synaptolepis, is being over-harvested incredibly. They are moving further and further, the, the traders are, get, are going further and further north of Africa to get this plant because in South Africa it's getting threatened. So. Um, a lot of these plants are over-harvested because of the industry, and so we need spaces where, and we need actually, actually quite urgently conservation strategies in South Africa because the government's not that interested what happens with the medicinal plants. So we really need to work with that um, you know, into the future. And some examples of plants that I've just come across, chrysanthemoides. So what they do is they burn these, these branches in the huts of mad people who are going through a trauma, and it relaxes the person. So that's an old style of doing it. Tecomeria, the wild uh, honeysuckle. That's always been like calling me, and I'd be really interested to know. The, the roots have soporphoric effects, so it helps you sleep. So there's quite a lot of anecdotal evidence that um, different reports that it actually has sleep-inducing properties. And what, I, what was interesting is I found that a lot of the trees, especially the fruit trees from South Africa, the roots have been experimented with and have psychoactive use, especially for convulsive conditions. So the African people really experimented very deeply, I mean, literally, like taking the roots out. And I've made the, I just thought about it one day when I was doing a walk, that why would the roots have maybe so much psychoactive properties? And I made the connection that possibly it's because of all the fermentation, you know, the, what's happening in the soil uh, um, breakdown, that the, the roots obviously are making a lot of chemicals to protect themselves. So there's also a lot of psychoactive compounds beneath the ground. So that, that makes sense to me. Um, there's a lot of roots, tree roots especially, that are used for epilepsy, dementia, convulsive conditions, mental conditions. So that's a whole, that could, that could fuel a lot of research. This is a plant that's most, very commonly used by African diviners called Mpepo, so it's the everlasting family, it's a flower, and they burn this before they divine, before they do the bones. I don't know if you if guys have ever seen African uh, movies of African diviners where they throw the bones. Often they're not actually bones, there's only two bones, and they're mostly seashells and other objects. But what happens is that this plant, it actually relaxes the body, but then it subtly opens like that intuition and sensitivity. So they use it to, to diagnose and to, and to do divination. And that's a Sclepius fruticosa. So what they do is they take the, the aerial parts and the leaves and they grind it into a green snuff and they use it for pain, for headaches. Um, and there, there's, there's so many examples that you could show, but that's, that's one that's commonly used for preventing headaches. And so the outcomes of the project is cultural preservation because like the other 
uh, Nigel was m mentioning. Traditional healers, my, my teacher, her, her children were not interested. I was actually spending more time with her, with her than her daughter. They were interested in you know, social media, not interested in the herbs at all. So there's a real lack. Um, once the traditional healer dies, there's this gap now. So we really need to, to, um, to document from, what, from the, the last generation that's still living. I just heard the other day of a traditional healer who has amazing medicines for bone density, for recovering serious bone problems. And this, this, this guy who's crippled, that I, a, friend that I, a new friend that I've made, he took this medicine and after three, four months, his bone density is like completely, he's like back, he was actually like, the doctor said, no, you're gonna be on crutches and you know, there's not much we can do for you. This old Inyanga's medicine in the Northern province has sorted it. So these, these people have sophisticated knowledge, which, and when that man dies, he's already, I think, he, I think he's in his 80s or, you know. He's, so when he goes, who knows if he's left that knowledge. And a lot of it, most in South Africa, all of it is, is orally, orally transmitted. So there's no written records. My teacher was quite different. She actually wrote a book of each of her formulas. So this shows how she was a special, special person. Um, she wrote this huge compendium, which she was very, she told me like, you know, you better finish this book, you know, and you must write. And I was a bit lazy, lazy and shit. But eventually I did, you know. So she was uh, very wise. So she wrote down her, her knowledge. And um, so when the Kanisa project uh, gets going, we, we are um, in the process of securing funding and we're looking for collaborations. We've identified a couple of sites in South Africa to start the pilot. Um, and what's gonna happen is that the local communities are gonna um, have, they're gonna, the idea is to, for them to own those medicinal plants. Because right now the community is not really owning them. They, you know, traders are coming in and selling them. But the idea is for the whole community to literally see it as their gold, as their resource that they can then generate substantial amounts of money from through ethnobotanical tourism. So, and also have access benefit sharing with universities and, and researchers. And then publications and furthering, basically furthering our understanding of healing consciousness with traditional plant medicine. So there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's it from me. Thanks. Right.